Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! First, the NHS is in the middle of what's been called a humanitarian crisis, with hospitals issuing over 200 serious alerts in six days this month. Meanwhile, Downing Street is trading blows with doctors and the head of the health service over who's to blame. Well, I'm joined now by the Conservative MP and the chair of the Health Select Committee, Dr Sarah Williston. Good morning. Thanks for being with us. So, it feels as though we are getting these almost continual warnings of the NHS being in crisis. Is there a risk that it's a bit like the boy who cried wolf, we just stop listening? Are things really worse this time? Well, we should be listening. I think what's different is that, whereas in the past, yes, we've always had winter pressures. I worked in the NHS for 24 years and there was always winter pressures. But what's different now is those pressures are year round, but they're getting much more severe over the winter. So this is a very genuinely serious situation. And the Red Cross has referred to it as a humanitarian crisis. Would you agree with that? I think that goes too far. I think what people think of when they use that term are these kind of absolutely catastrophic situations faced by people across places like Syria and Yemen. But that's not to underestimate the fact that this is a very serious situation for us here. But no, I wouldn't have used that terminology myself. And there have been warnings before about um, this happening, some of them coming from your own committee, the Health First Select Committee. Back in October, your committee wrote to the government, I think we can have a look, um, at what you said uh, shortly, uh, was, which was that accident emergency departments in England are managing unprecedented mm. levels of demand. And then you went on to say, we call on the government to make sure that sufficient funding is available. Was that warning actually taken seriously enough? Well, I think that certainly much more needs to be done. And we carried out our study it, it earlier than the autumn because we wanted the NHS to be ready. And there's no doubt that the NHS has made some, some plans this winter to try and put in place measures where they're under pressure to try and respond to that. These so-called opal alerts or black alerts, as they used to be called in the past. But what we need to do is think of this as a whole system, uh, right through from trying to avoid people going to casualty who don't need to be there. But more importantly, to think about this is about the frailty and the complexity of the problems that people are coming to casualty with and how we actually move them through hospital and critically out back at home uh, when they're ready to be discharged and, and that's why we've got to think of social care as well as um, the NHS together rather than these two separate systems a sort of health pound and a social care pound it's got to be a patient pound and a taxpayer pound and how that all works together so you're really just looking at the whole system, the whole system as a whole complex um, when I spoke to Theresa May about the NHS last week when she was on this show, um, she said quite clearly that the NHS was asked what it needed and then she goes on to say, we gave them that funding. She actually said, in fact, we gave them more funding than they required. Is that true? Well, I don't think that is strictly true. I mean, certainly the term that the government uses of um, a figure of a 10 billion figure, what that does just refer to is NHS England spending. But of course, there were transfers from other budgets into that that we would normally think of as health spending. It also refers to a longer time period, six years rather than five, and it changes the basis why we would calculate what's called a real terms increase. So yes, you can see how the government's reached that figure, but the committee felt that a fairer figure, if we're using the usual measures, was actually 4.5 billion, which is a very different number and if we're going to think of this as a whole system you've also got to think of social care and what Simon Stevens the head of the NHS was very clear when he spoke to the committee about was that if you have cuts to social care that has an enormous impact on the NHS so that's why he doesn't agree um, and I would agree with him that in fact the NHS hasn't been given everything it asks for um, because it doesn't actually consider social care and it doesn't consider the cuts to public health budgets, the kind of prevention work that we know is essential if we're going to reduce demand on the NHS. So it sounds like you've got some sympathy then for Simon Stevens because there have been these reports that yes. the government was trying to blame him for actually not doing enough to try and alleviate the crisis. Well, um, personally, I think that is unreasonable. I think that as a, as a public servant and um, somebody who heads the NHS, um, he, 
the government needs to give him their unequivocal support in the very hard job that he is undertaking to try and get this whole system to work. His five-year plan is a very important plan, um, and I think that it's very important that he's not undermined. And also, there's a very important principle here. We hear NHS all the time, NHS staff being told that they have to be transparent and honest in the way they talk about data. Um, it would send a terrible message if the head of the NHS wasn't free to be exactly the same. And, and I think that what he said was absolutely correct. So you seem quite critical then of some aspects of how the government's handled it. Are you personally disappointed mm -hmm. at all with how Theresa May is dealing with what you would see as a crisis in the NHS? Well, she has a huge agenda with Brexit, and I think the government has to be very careful that they're not distracted from what I think is the most important domestic agenda, and that is how we're managing health and social care together. And I think that really what she could do, because government is going to be so distracted with this, is to try and take some of the party politics out of this. And uh, what myself and others are calling for is to allow a cross-party group to get on and examine all the ways that we could move our spending closer to those of our comparable European neighbours um, as a percentage of what we earn as an, and spend as a nation so that we can actually deliver the results that we know the, cap the NHS is capable of delivering. It's very efficient, it's, uh, it's a very effective and it's hugely important to the public but, but we need to try and take the politics out of this and sort out how we're going to properly fund it in my view. Talking about how to funding of course is a big, uh, mm. big question. The government is trying to say that GPs need to do more, that actually that they should have their funding withdrawn unless they open longer and they have got a bit of a point here haven't they? I mean with all the pressure in A&E how can it be right that some doctor surgeries are shutting up shop at lunchtime? Well as a former GP I would just reflect that just sometimes because they're not actually holding surgeries at that time they're very often doing other vital things so a huge amount of administration and uh, home visits and so forth. At the so same time though, there are lots of other professions that have to do paperwork I mean teachers for example who mm. get paid much less than GPs mm. they have to do administration they don't shut their schools but, at lunchtime. But very often that needs to take place during work working hours because very often you're chasing up results and so forth so or, or actually liaising with colleagues so or going to meetings with colleagues so I'd say it's quite complex and certainly as somebody who has worked in the NHS for 24 years what I would say is it's it's entirely wrong to blame just one section of the workforce for this GPs are extraordinarily stretched working under relentless pressure as bed numbers are, are being cut we now have the lowest number of beds per head in Europe um, what we're finding is more and more complex conditions coming back to primary care. So the work of GPs is changing and, and the pressures on them are relentless. The, the workforce simply isn't there in many parts of the country. So I think to then be suggesting that all of this problem is due to GPs not seeing people, it's, it's, it's really stretching it. It's just not the case and wrong to scapegoat them in my view. Complex problems mm. need some uh, big solutions and mm -hmm. some big thinking as well. Sarah Williston, thank you so much well, for thank you. being with us today.